Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants in charge of their recordings please start? Recording to PC, all set. Thank you. Recording to cloud is all good. Thank you. Backup, and reco backup recording is good. Thank you. And Sergeant Biondo, will you be able to start with your opening? Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the committees of higher education jointly with civil service and labor. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification? To minimize any disruptions, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning. And thank you for joining today's virtual joint committee on high, uh, committee on higher education and committee on social service and labor hearing on adjunct faculty and the City University of New York or CUNY. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alum. I want to thank Councilmember I. Danique Miller, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor for joining us to hold this very important hearing. Witnesses testifying today include CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, Matthew, Matthew Sapienza and Pamela Silverblatt, Senior Vice Chancellor for Labor Relations. Also invited to testify are the Professional Staff Congress, which is CUNY's Faculty Union, and the University Faculty Senate, University Student Senate, Adjunct Faculty, and Labor Advocates Groups and other interested parties. We last conducted a joint hearing on CUNY Adjunct Faculty in late January of this year. It seems so long ago that this hearing was, considered, was conducted in person just weeks before businesses and schools closed and life transitioned to remote communication platforms due to COVID-19. In the months since that hearing, it is remarkable to reflect on the tremendous resilience and progress we as a city and indeed many of our institutions like CUNY have displayed as we collectively adjusted to the quote new normal end quote of living through a pandemic. But just a few days ago, a long serving adjunct art history professor at CUNY's Mega Evers College published op-ed addressing what he referred to as a quote, two-tiered system for CUNY professors. This op-ed underscored the many themes about the challenges of adjunct faculty employment as opposed to full-time or tenured professorships that we previously explored and will be following up on at today's hearing. For instance, last January, we recognized and indeed applauded the gains won by CUNY's adjunct faculty through a collective bargaining agreement that now provides them with a higher pay rate per course and other salary enhancements, such as paid office hours. But CUNY's institutional response to COVID-19 also taught us that these gains mean absolutely nothing without the job security, and related benefits that are routinely afforded to full-time professors and employees. Over the summer, CUNY modified, notified nearly 3,000 adjunct professors and contingent faculty that their contracts would not be renewed, leaving many without insurance or health care during a pandemic. These unilateral layoffs illuminated what the professor referred to as a quote, emotional and stressful roller coaster, end quote, of unstable adjunct employment. Feeling like you could be fired any minute, not knowing you, whether you'll be given enough courses to pay rent and having to rely on secondary jobs to cover your own living costs or while class sizes have increased to levels that are untenable for students and professors alike. I would be remiss if I did not note that these matters are even more alarming when one looks at the racial, 
and ethnic demographics of adjunct faculty generally. As we observed at our hearing last January, national studies have shown that underrepresented minorities in adjunct positions have continued to grow, while in contrast, underrepresented minorities in full-time tenure track positions have done so at a substantially lower rate. I posed the following question in January, which is, why aren't we institutionally, why are we institutional, institutionally marginalizing our minorities in academia in comparison to their white counterparts? I'll say that again. Why are we institutionally marginalizing our minorities in academia in comparison to their white counterparts? Especially now at this time when the COVID-19 pandemic is ravaging our black and brown communities, why are we not providing our black and brown adjuncts more opportunities, stability, and job security? I cannot stand by the case that adjunct faculty employment models represents a, co a quote, cost savings matter for universities. This is an issue that transcends cost savings and raises serious concerns about race and the lack of racial equity in academia and hiring today. We have lots of questions for you regarding these matters, but first I would like to thank Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation and CUNY liaison, Michelle Perrigan, the, community, the committee's financial analyst, and a special thanks and a fond farewell and bon voyage and best wishes to Paul Senegal, counsel for the committee who will be leaving and moving on to another session. And for the members of the committee, um, I can't see who they are, but I will, I see council member Maisel is here. And as others uh, are noted, I will acknowledge them as well. And at this time, I will pass uh, to the co-chair, council member Biden. Thank you so much, Chair Barron. It is great to see you. Great to be here this morning. Good morning, everyone. I am Councilmember Idenik Miller, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank my co-chair, Inez Barron, uh, the Chair of Higher Ed, uh, Higher Education, and welcome everybody to this morning's hearing. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues uh, that have joined us. I, uh, uh, from the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, Councilmember Adams, Lewis, and Orich as well. Uh, today's joint hearing will focus on adjunct faculty in the city of New York, CUNY. CUNY is the largest urban public university in the United States, providing accessibility to higher education to more than two, uh, 274,000 uh, degree seeking students and 276,000 adult and continuing education students over 25 college campuses across the city of New York. For many, especially in New York City, CUNY has been the stepping stone to a better quality of life. In order to run cohesively and effectively <clears throat> as it does, CUNY employs a wide range of distinguished employees. CUNY faculty has boasted Nobel laureates, members of national acad uh, academics, and Pulitzer Prize winners, administrators and professors, both tenured and with those who are adjuncts, which make up the heart of CUNY. Adjunct faculty are those faculty members who work in limited capacity for the universities. Adjuncts can be professors, associate professors, assistant professors. Adjunct fa faculty en ensures that students at C CUNY are adequately taught and served each and every day. Although vital to CUNY, when we held this hearing in January, we learned that adjunct faculty are often employees who are underappreciated and undercompensated, work often in difficult conditions with few benefits. For example, there are no standardized hiring process for adjuncts. Adjuncts frequently work under the threat of having those courses canceled just days before they began rarely receive health insurance and typically have little to say in the university's governance. In efforts to ensure that adjuncts are treated better and compensated more fairly, the Professional Staff Congress, 
or PSC, which is the bargaining unit, which represents the faculty here at CUNY, CUNY including adjuncts, has fought for additional benefits for adjunct faculty. Most notably, the union's work was seen in the recent December 19 ratification of a new contract between PSC and CUNY. The contract spans a total of 63 months and is retroactive to December 1st of 2017 and will go through February 28th of 23. As my colleague, uh, Chair Barron has noted, due to the unexpected course of COVID panic, uh, pandemic, Governor Cuomo held, withheld additional 20% of the state's funding of the university's budget, resulting in layoffs for nearly 3,000 adjunct faculty, as well as reduced course offerings. Given that so many of the staff are experiencing layoffs or reduced hours, it is essential for the committee to make sure that the terms of the previously ratified collective bargaining agreement are implemented successfully, that we ensure that adjunct faculty who hear, who bear a very heavy load in ensuring that CUNY system runs e efficiently and successfully receive adequate labor and the health protections as agreed upon uh, during this crisis. Today, I would like to understand exactly the differences between adjunct and tenured staff at CUNY, however, and as well as the implementations of the contract uh, uh, and if, if, if there are any shortfalls. And certainly if there is so, if there had been any engagement and impact bargaining over new provisions, uh, which may have changed the uh, terms and agreement of, of, of uh, employment uh, based on COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has threatened the health and economy and livelihood of so many. Particularly important today is the demographic data for adjuncts as compared to full-time and tenured professors at CUNY. I wanna know if there is a notice, noticeable racial and ethnic disparity within CUNY when looking at adjuncts and full-time tenured professors what can be done to address these disparities? If so, and these are some of the many questions that we will be uh, checking in with CUNY and PSC as well as advocates in order to ensure that CUNY and New York City education in whole uh, is fair and equitable workplace to where we, where we can teach and learn. I would like to uh, thank my staff, <clears throat> Chief of Staff, Mr. Ali, <clears throat> Ali Rasulunajad, uh, Brandon Clark, my legislative director and senior advisor, uh, Mr. Joe Goldblum. Uh, also like to thank senior staff for the work that they have done in preparing this new set, Thomas, Kendall, Elizabeth, and uh, John, our financial uh, analyst. <clears throat> so uh, with that, I'll kick it back to Chair uh, Barron, and thank you very much. I'm looking forward to robust, robust uh, hearing this morning. Thank you. Chair Barron, you are on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I will pass it to our policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, who will review the operating procedures for today. Thank you, Chair Barrett. My name is Chloe Rivera, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. At today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the City University of New York, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. In order of speaking, we have Matthew Sapienza, Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer at CUNY, and Pamela Silverblatt, Senior Vice Chancellor for Labor Relations at CUNY. 
I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but, our, but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Senior Vice Chancellor Sapienza? I do. Thank you. Senior Vice Chancellor Silverblatt? I do. Thank you. We will now hear from CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor, Chief Financial Officer Sapienza. Senior Vice Chancellor, you may begin once it tes your testimony once a member of our staff unmutes you. Thank you and good morning, Chairperson Barron and Chairperson Miller and members of the Higher Education and Civil Service and Labor Committees. I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about adjunct faculty employment at the City University of New York. As you know, CUNY, like every institution of higher learning has been greatly impacted by COVID-19. This impact on CUNY has been especially keen because we are located in New York City, the epicenter of, COVID, of the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States. And because COVID-19 disproportionately affected the very neighborhoods where many of our students live, we experienced firsthand how the pandemic changed our community. Beginning in March, 2020, CUNY converted almost 50,000 in-person courses to distance education. This required our faculty, many who had not taught online before, to quickly revise their course syllabi, learn new platforms, and adopt new pedagogical strategies to create the conditions for their students to meet the corresponding learning outcomes. Staff adapted to remote work and continue to give valuable advice and support to colleagues, as well as to deliver wraparound student support services. And it required all involved, faculty, students, and staff to do all of this while caring for family and adapting to a new complicated reality. We are very grateful for our faculty, staff, and students. We are especially grateful for our essential workers who have continued to ensure that our campuses are protected and safely maintained. As a result of the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, the university has experienced reductions in revenue, seen public funding significantly reduced, and been obliged to take on unplanned emergency expenditures. We have been forced to make decisions that only months ago were unimaginable. CUNY's funding comes from three principal sources, tuition, appropriations from New York City, and appropriations from New York State. The New York City adopted budget for fiscal year 2021 provided $464.6 million in funding for CUNY community colleges and includes a reduction target of 46.3 million. This reduction target represents 9% of the community college's base budget and is in addition to a $20 million reduction that was made by the city for the community colleges during April 2020 as the impact of the pandemic began to affect New York City finances. We are anticipating further city reductions in the November financial plan update, which will be announced later this month. And I just wanna take a moment to go off script and thank Chair Barron and all the members of the council who advocated so strongly for restorations to CUNY's ASAP program during the adopted budget process. The New York state budget as adopted in April, 2020 provided $2 billion for CUNY for fiscal year 2021 approximately the same time, I'm, I'm sorry, approximately the same amount as for fiscal year 2020. It was clear at the time, however, that extraordinary public health and economic relief expenditures would require adjustments depending on federal aid. So the budget agreement gave the state budget director the authority to reduce budget allocations during the fiscal year. The state division of budget has estimated a current year revenue decline of $14.9 billion, which represents a loss of about 15%. If there is no assistance from the federal government from, or New York State to offset this revenue loss, we at CUNY are facing a risk of a permanent reduction. CUNY expected and told the city council at a public hearing in June 2020 that the pandemic would sharply decrease tuition revenue because of economic pressure on its students, many of whom had previously worked full or part time and would not be able to pay tuition during the crisis, and many of whom depended on crowded buses and subways to get to and from class. Presently, the fall semester enrollment is now 5.1%, which has resulted in a $52 million loss in revenue. CUNY previously lost $32 million in revenue for the spring 2020 semester due to a reduction in tuition and other revenue collections. 
CUNY also spent almost $75 million on unplanned emergency costs related to the pandemic. Expenses that included the purchase of laptops and iPads for students, the cost for deep cleaning buildings, overtime costs for public safety and facilities personnel, the purchase of PPEs, cleaning products, signage, and other costs associated with transitioning the distance learning across the system. Given the announced budget cuts from the city, the, pro the projected decrease in enrollment for the fall 2020 semester and the significant state revenue decline, it became impracticable and irresponsible to continue operations as normal. Since about 80% of CUNY's costs relate to personnel, any serious budget cuts will necessarily involve position reductions. CUNY has largely frozen new hiring in order to generate budget savings, but otherwise has so far preserved the employment of its full-time faculty and full-time professional staff and has not instituted layoffs of full-time faculty and administrators. The University Vacancy Review Board was established in April and has reduced payroll costs by keeping vacant or consolidating the responsibilities of existing positions, saving the university $33 million in annualized costs as of September. The university's total full-time staffing level has been reduced by 468 positions since the hiring freeze was announced. Adjunct faculty, unlike tenure-track faculty, are part-time faculty paid on a per-course basis for limited terms. Non-teaching adjuncts and adjunct laboratory technicians are adjunct versions of their full-time counterparts. CUNY employed about 14,000 teaching and non-teaching adjuncts in fiscal year 2020 at a total cost of about $309 million. We very much value the critical contribution of our adjuncts, which was underscored in the historic collective bargaining agreement that was announced in October 2019, in which adjunct pay per course was increased by over 70%. Faced with the extreme, with the extreme unannounced and, un and, and anticipated budget cuts, as well as projected enrollment losses, CUNY campuses determined that it had to decline to renew the appointments of approximately 2,800 adjuncts, mostly faculty, which saved about $30 million. Their appointments expired according to their normal contractual terms as of June 30th, 2020, and were not renewed as allowed by the collective bargaining agreement. Last week, as part of our continued financial management in this challenging environment, the chancellor announced that all managerial employees under the executive compensation plan will be furloughed five days this fiscal year. As a result of our sustained transition to distance learning, we have also reduced costs through the consolidation of campus space, eliminated travel, and have enhanced our energy savings. The increase of 16% in our summer session enrollment also generated additional revenue that has helped defray costs incurred this fall. Traditionally, the University Board of Trustees has presented a budget for the new fiscal year in June, the presentation and approval process for the fiscal year 21 budget has been delayed until more information is available regarding another federal stimulus bill and its impact on state and city finances. The federal government did allocate $250 million to CUNY earlier this year as part of the CARES Act. That included $118 million in direct aid to students, almost all of which has been distributed to 197,000 students so far. The remaining 132 million is to be distributed as part of the university's fiscal year 21 budget. We, recent, we recently allocated 41 million of the funds to cover the college's reimbursement for student tuition and fees, health and wellness expenses, and IT infrastructure expenses. The use of CARES Act funds is subject to various oversight agencies and will be audited as part of the university's annual uniform guidance audit. If the US Department of Education considers any expenditures inappropriate, it may disallow the expenditure. According to the CARES Act institutional letter sent on April 21st, 2020, the United States Secretary of Education stated, and I quote, while I know you face many challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, I encourage you to use the portion of, of your award for recipients institutional costs to expand your remote learning programs, build your IT capacity to support such programs, and train faculty and staff to operate effectively in a remote learning environment. These activities will help ensure that learning can continue for your students during the nation's recovery from the coronavirus pandemic and strengthen your position to support continued learning in the future. I also encourage you to consider using the funds for recipients institutional costs to expand support for your students with the most significant financial needs arising from the coronavirus pandemic, including eligible expenditure 
expenses under a student's cost of attendance, such as course materials, technology, healthcare, childcare, food and housing, end quote. Although CUNY has not yet finalized its plans for the remaining funds in detail, it anticipates broadly using them in a student-centric manner. Aid to our students will also prevent further deterioration of enrollment. And because enrollment drives the need for full-time and adjunct faculty, non-teaching adjuncts and other professional staff, aid to students to generate additional enrollment helps preserve these faculty and professional staff positions from further erosion. The CARES Act funds are one-time federal resources that will no longer be available once spent. The CARES Act funds did not and will not meet all the needs of our students. These needs have become even more acute as a result of COVID-19. The federal government's failure to provide additional resources makes it increasingly difficult to weather the economic impact of this continuing health crisis. We urge the federal government to act soon and provide much needed additional assistance to New York State, New York City, and institutions of higher education. Chairpersons Barron and Miller, please know that the university very much appreciates the unwavering support of the city council for CUNY students and staff, and particularly to the both of you for your leadership in those efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor Silver Blatt. Uh, Senior Vice Chancellor, you may begin the testimony once a member of our staff unmutes you. Good morning, Chairs Barron and Miller, and members of the Committees on Higher Education and Civil Service and Labor. It is nice to see you again. I'm Pamela Silverblatt, Senior Vice Chancellor for Labor Relations at the City University of New York. I last appeared before the committees meeting jointly last January. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and provide you with an update since I was here last. When I reported in January, we had recently concluded the negotiations for a new collective bargaining agreement between CUNY and the Professional Staff Congress CUNY, the union representing the faculty and professional administrative staff at CUNY. So much has happened in our country and in the world since then. Most importantly, I wish good health for you and your families, and I hope that you and your families and those close to you have been spared the ravages of the COVID pandemic. When I was here last, we were very proud of the collective bargaining agreement we were able to achieve with the PSC with the state and city support. As I said then, Chancellor Matos Rodriguez described the agreement as an embodiment of CUNY's strong and unwavering commitment to its faculty, both full and part-time and its staff and the PSC's leadership, as well as members of the rank and file, had variously hailed the agreement as an historic turning point that is principled and imaginative, a victory for every member of the union and for CUNY students, and a critical investment in the quality of education CUNY provides that will pay dividends for years to come. The contract had several significant enhancements for CUNY adjunct faculty, and I'd like to give you an update on the status of those matters. But I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge upfront the non reappointments of adjunct faculty that were necessitated by the budget uncertainties brought on by the pandemic last spring. I'll come back to discuss those actions in a moment. But first, let me bring you up to date on actions taken to implement the contract since I last appeared. As you know, the collective bargaining agreement is a 63 month contract that has five 2% wage increases, compounding at 10.41%. By the time I last appeared before you, the first two 2% across the board salary increases were already due. Teaching adjuncts will, of course, benefit from the across the board wage increases that I'm sorry, the across the board wage increases that apply to all employees in the PSC bargaining unit. Those increases were implemented and paid, including with retroactivity last spring in March. When I last testified, I focused on the contract significant economic and structural enhancements for CUNY's approximately 12,000 adjuncts. These enhancements are primarily in three categories, salary, 
student success and adjunct professional development and stability. As I said at the time, over the life of the agreement, adjunct pay will increase by more than 70% for the lowest paid adjunct lecturers, raising their pay for a three credit course from $3,222 to $5,500. This is accomplished in several ways. Very importantly, starting last spring, in the spring 2020 semester, for each three credit course taught, teaching adjuncts began to be required to hold and receive additional compensation for one office hour per week. Because of this restructuring in the way adjuncts work, an adjunct teaching a three credit course received more than a 38% pay increase starting in spring 2020. I should note that the enhancements in the last contract follow significant positive enhancements for adjunct faculty over the last several years, including the provision of stable quality health insurance by inclusion in the city health benefits program and greater job stability through the opportunity for three year appointments. Just after the salary increases were implemented and the new office hours implemented, the COVID-19 crisis struck New York, and the university had to quickly pivot to remote learning and work. With no notice, CUNY had to transition 275,000 students to online classes and move 45,000 employees to working from home. When we initially moved to remote, there was no indication of how long we would be in that mode, or how profoundly the pandemic would affect New York. With a focus on getting our students through the semester without losing credit momentum, the faculty and staff at CUNY performed in an exemplary fashion. Everyone prioritized the students, put their best foot forward, and even those less skilled with technology, made their best effort to ensure satisfactory completion for the students. As the spring progressed, sorry, excuse me. As the spring progressed and we realized that remote learning would likely continue in the fall, the Office of Academic Affairs worked closely with the colleges to provide professional development opportunities for both the full and part-time faculty to enhance their skills at online teaching. In partnership with the CUNY School of Professional Studies, Academic Affairs developed the Online Teaching Essentials Workshop designed to bolster faculty skills for online teaching and learning in six areas. The workshop covered understanding the online learning environment, structuring the online learning experience, communicating and interacting online, online presence and engagement, effective online assessment, and course scheduling and reflection. Nearly 1,700 faculty have completed the training for which they are compensated, and slightly more than half of those faculty were adjunct faculty. Throughout the spring, as the pandemic raged, the havoc it was wreaking on the state and city budgets became a daily topic of conversation. CUNY's financial situation, dependent as it is on both the city and state for revenue, became very serious. In addition to enrollment projections for the fall 2020 semester indicating a coming downturn in the number of students, the collective bargaining agreement between CUNY and the Professional Staff Congress requires CUNY to provide adjuncts with notice of whether they will have an appointment in the fall by May 15th. Because of the uncertainty of the budget, because of the uncertainty of the budget and enrollment situations, CUNY asked the PSC to extend that deadline, hoping that we would have more certainty before making reappointment decisions. CUNY and the PSC agreed to push the deadline back, initially to May 29th and then to June 30th. 
having to notify the adjuncts of their fall assignments by June 30th, the colleges made decisions using the information they had available at the time. We were in the middle of the pandemic with an uncertain fiscal future combined with an anticipated decline in enrollment. In the face of that constellation of circumstances, the colleges non-reappointed almost 3,000 adjuncts out of a total of approximately 12,000 teaching adjuncts. The specific decisions regarding reappointment and non-reappointment are made locally at the colleges. Since those spring non-reappointments, nearly 660 of the non-reappointed adjuncts have been reappointed for the fall 2020 semester. As we sit here today, nearly five months since those non-reappointments, the university's fiscal situation continues to be very serious. Just last week, Chancellor Matos Rodriguez sent a letter to the university community advising of a $45 million reduction in support from New York City to our community college budgets, the need for CUNY to spend about $75 million in unplanned expenditures related to COVID, the risk in state aid if there is no additional assistance from the federal government for New York State, the loss of revenue due to enrollment declines, and the loss of revenue due to reductions in tuition and other revenue sources. Since last spring, the university has had a vacancy review board in place, which has reduced CUNY's full-time staffing by 468 positions, resulting in an annualized savings to the university of over $30 million. Most recently, the chancellor announced that managerial employees at the university will be furloughed for five days during this fiscal year. The university continues to act prudently and take necessary steps to protect our core mission of providing high quality education to the students of New York City. Once again, thank you for this opportunity. If there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Chair Barron for questions. Uh, thank you so much. I do want to thank uh, both uh, senior vice chancellors for their testimony and what they've shared with us. I have lots of questions and uh, following my questions, I'll share with my co-chair. You just now talked about, I think 468 positions uh, that are not going to be filled. Is that what you said? And if that is what you said, can you give us the range of the titles of those 468 positions? Yes, thank you, Chair Barron. Yeah, since the um, university instituted a hiring freeze in late April and we, um, we created a university vacancy review board to review all um, hiring requests, since that time, since late April through the end of September, we don't have October data yet, but through the end of September, the total number of full-time positions has come down by 468 positions, um, which represents a um, little over 2% of our total full-time staff. We have about 19,000 full-time staff at the university. And so it, it includes the gamut of full-time positions at the university, faculty, administrative, managerial, staff, um, all positions. And I'd like to get that disaggregated and get that data. Uh, sure, we can do that and get that to you, yeah. And at the start of the, two, the 2020 semester, you announced that you would not be reappointing uh, 3,000 adjuncts to teach in the fall. So can you give us a breakdown of how many adjuncts were laid off, including how many individual courses were canceled as a result of those non-reappointments? So I can, I can give you by college the um, numbers of non-reappointments. I can either read through that today if you would like, or we can provide that to you after. Read um, it. Just summarize it. I'd just like to get an idea of how that played out across each college. Sure. sure. 
Um, so, so actually, Chair Barron, it varies significantly across the university and from college to college. The colleges each made their own. The colleges are in different situations vis-a-vis -vis their their budgets, and they each made individual decisions. There are some colleges that non-reappointed um, what looked like some number of hundreds of adjuncts at the time, and there are some colleges that non-reappointed much smaller numbers of adjuncts. And then, as I said, there was, um, I would say, uh, a modest amount of rehiring of adjuncts. Um, some of the colleges did rehire um, more than 100 adjuncts. Some of those that laid off the greatest numbers did rehire uh, more than 100 adjuncts between June and the start of the September semester. Across each of the campuses that we have, is there a percentage that you can share with us that uh, we can identify as courses that are taught by adjuncts? Because I want to uh, get an understanding additionally to how it impacts the adjuncts by their sheer numbers, the impact on students, because now those courses are not being offered. Um, I, we can we can get you, I believe that we can follow up and get you information related to the percentage of adjunct teaching at each of the colleges that's not sitting in front of me today, but I'm, I'm sure that we can follow up and, and get you that information. Um, with respect to courses, courses vary, the courses taught vary by semester, they vary by enrollment. Um, I, I think that there are many decisions that go into the needs for scheduling and what does and doesn't get scheduled in any particular semester. And you said it's a campus by campus decision. Who does the president involve in making decision as to which courses or which uh, titles of adjuncts will not be rehired? Is there, so, is there a committee that he relies on to help him decide if in fact there will be a reduction, who will not be reappointed? Um, my the understanding is that, I'm sorry. The expectation that there will not be a single person making that decision without uh, having the input, significant and, and actual input of others to, to make that decision. Are departments right. asked? Yes, so my, yes. yes, I believe that those decisions start at a departmental level um, in terms of what the programming will look like in any given semester. And then of course, um, largely, I think, depending on the structure of a school, you may have chairs that report to an assistant dean or a dean, and those folks ultimately report to a college provost, and the provost ultimately reports to the president. But there is academic involvement at the departmental level in making those decisions. And if a department chair recommends that a person be um, reassigned, rehired, reappointed, does that in fact happen? I can't answer that question today as I sit here. I would think um, that what would happen is that the department chair would have, you know, certain constraints, certain limitations and, and parameters within which to work, that they have courses that have to be offered in order for students to have the programs they need to fulfill their majors. And at the same time, they have I would uh, likely a budget that that they have to be mindful of, but that if a, a particular chair at a particular college felt that he or she wasn't going to be able to fulfill the the um, the curricular needs or needed additional personnel to fulfill those curricular needs, that he or she would would have conversations with their deans and or their provosts to discuss any adjustments that might be warranted. 
Um, so we're talking about faculty that has not been uh, reappointed, and we're talking about some faculty that have in fact been rehired, even though they were not initially given a letter. So we know that PSC, the Professional Staff Congress, is that body that represents this faculty. So have you provided them with a complete list of the adjuncts or other contingent faculty and staff that were not reappointed last spring? And how many of those that were not reappointed lost access to the employer provided health insurance? So PSC- What kind of information? I'm sorry. What, I'm sorry, you cut out. Can you just repeat? Yes. What kind of sharing have you done with PSC okay. and Transparent so that they would know what's going on? Sure. So um, last spring, we provided PSC with aggregate numbers by college of uh, adjuncts that were non-reappointed, including aggregate numbers of adjuncts who at the time ultimately stood to lose their CUNY-sponsored health insurance. They, they did not immediately lose it. They might have had health insurance through June or July or some through the entire summer. And of course, some people would have opted for COBRA and may still have have employer sponsored health insurance through COBRA. So we gave the union those aggregate numbers at the time. And the union has subsequently requested names of um, adjuncts, I think names and departments specifically of adjuncts who have been non reappointed so that they can reach out. And we are in the process of gathering that information. President Bowen reiterated that request last week. That information is being compiled so that the union will have that information shortly to be able to reach out. And so since you had given them that number in the spring, what is that number? The number of non-reappointed adjuncts that we shared with them at the time was 2,990. And the number of adjuncts that stood to lose health insurance as a result of their non reappointments was 422. Now, that number, uh, it sounds just like a, a large number. Uh, it sounds like such a great number. Why is that number so high? We know that CUNY relies on adjuncts for the bulk of the instruction that goes on. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the bulk of the courses that are taught at CUNY are taught by adjunct faculty. So why are we now gutting that body that is responsible for delivering the instruction and providing now counseling and office hours? Why are we gutting that? So every spring, spring into fall, there are, and at fall into spring, there are adjuncts whose appointments come to an end and who are not reappointed. And so, for example, in spring um, 19, going into fall 20, so for the prior year, there were over 1,800 adjuncts who were non reappointed at that point. So this year, the number was. 2,900 as opposed to 1,800. And the difference is owing to the situation and circumstances that Matt and I both described and that have you know, struck the world and, and wreaked havoc on the world and the city. The so, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, 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 so, go ahead. You said last year there were 1,800 non-reappointments. Am I then to conclude that there were 1,800 fewer adjuncts? Or were those 1,800, in fact, replaced by perhaps new adjuncts that were hired? So they may have, they're, they're, they may have been, um, some of them may have been rehired. Other adjuncts may have been hired, depending on the needs, the disciplines. Um, the only um, my only the only point that I'm making is that the non reappointments happen from semester to semester, and so the magnitude clearly the magnitude this year was bigger, but it wasn't 
that the magnitude is normally zero and this year was 2,900. I understand, but I would like to know the net difference. You say 1,800 last year would not be appointed, but there were others that were appointed or that got new employments. I'd like to know what that difference is. So I would appreciate if you could give that to me. Sure, um, I, I have, I don't mean to look away. I do have some data with me, but perhaps, how that is looking perhaps away it would be best to get it to you after. No, rather than being distracted, I'd rather have staff get it to you after, if okay, that's okay. That's fine. And I understand this new world that we're living in, you know, we're <laughs> looking at thousands of- screens all over. <laughs> very different, very different. Uh, what percentage or number of adjunct faculty lost their CUNY-sponsored health insurance as a result of these layoffs or non-reappointments? And what's the approximate cost of the monthly pre premiums that are associated with COBRA uh, health benefits extension? So, um, so I think we have about, we had about 22 or 2300 adjuncts receiving employer-sponsored health insurance and about 420 lost their health insurance. Presumably they were able to access COBRA and then perhaps private or other public health insurance, but that translates to, I would say about 20% of those that received um, employer-sponsored health insurance um, were affected. The answer to, um, the answer to the COBRA question is a little more complicated. So our employees are in the city health benefits plan. The adjuncts are in the same city health benefits plan as the full-time employees. And I suspect that the city council members are in that health benefits plan also. And so there are um, many different options of coverage that, that someone can take. And there are uh, options that are less expensive and more expensive. So the COBRA premium is 2% higher than the employer share. So whatever the employer share is, the COBRA premium is 2% is higher, so 102%. And that pertains um, to the adjuncts as it does to everyone else. And again, varies based on the individual the individual's choice about health insurance programs. And that's that's not determined by CUNY. That's, you know, that's part of this, the um, expectations of the city health benefits program. Thank you. I have lots more questions, but I'm going to uh, defer now to my co-chair, council member I. Danique Miller for his questions, and then I'll return. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Chair Barron. Um, uh, the chance has brought up such inf interest, interesting information uh, in their testimony and their subsequent questioning um, that I did have a few, uh, but I, I primarily want to focus on uh, the collective bargaining aspect of it and the impacts of, uh, of COVID-19 and imp implementation. But in the interim, could, could, could uh, the chance to respond to uh, the 5.1 um percent decrease that we've seen for the full semester in terms of revenue um talk about the specific impacts of that because i know uh you said that there was some additional hiring that was done uh um after the initial layoff that there were about 600 uh adjuncts that were were brought back but could we talk about the impacts on that and whether, as Council Member Barron alluded to, whether that actually had an impact on courses that were being served, uh, courses that were being delivered. And, sure. um, sure. yeah, and, and, and how that happened, um, <clears throat> how that was evaluated and how that impacted those matriculating and, and uh, how we determine what courses would, would no longer exist, thus um, what, adjuncts would no longer exist. Is that how that process works? Yeah, no, thanks, Chair, uh, Chair Miller, for, for the question on enrollment. Uh, without question is um, such a key component um, to financial management at the university. And um, 
So we, we were down 5.1%, as you mentioned, for fall 2020, compared to where we were in fall 2019. That resulted in a revenue loss of about $52 million. Um, tuition remain, remained the same as it did in the previous semester. So the tuition rates were the same. Um, so the fact that we had less students just meant less overall revenue of about $52 million. The, the enrollment losses are um, more so in the community colleges than in the four-year colleges. The four-year colleges overall are actually up a little bit um, in terms of fall 19 to fall 20 enrollment, up a little less than 1%. Again, every college is different. There are some colleges that are showing really strong enrollment gains, some that are low, but overall, the four-year colleges are up a little bit. Community colleges, though, are, are, are down. Um, and that's um, something that um, research has shown is happening throughout the country in terms of community colleges. It's happening throughout New York State in terms of SUNY's community colleges. Um, and so the community colleges, in terms of the revenue loss they're feeling from enrollment losses, um, is certainly more acute than it is at the senior colleges. There's no question about that. Um, and, in, and in terms of adjuncts reappointment, you know, going back to, to, to what my colleague, um, Senior Vice Chancellor Silverblatt said a few minutes ago, when campuses are evaluating the number of adjuncts they need, um, enrollment in those certain disciplines and within those certain departments is a key factor. Um, if enrollment is going down um, in a certain discipline or for a certain department, the decision might be made that they don't need as many adjuncts as they did the year before just because there's less students to serve. So enrollment um, is definitely a, a critical factor in that equation in making those determinations. So in, in terms of uh, the terms condition of employment amongst uh, for, for, for the adjuncts, um, do they come with a, with, with a uh, contractual length of service? So adjunct appointments can either be one semester, two semester, or in the contract prior to the contract we, we reported on last winter, um, we agreed to a pilot program for three-year adjunct appointments for adjuncts who met particular service requirements. So um, within that universe, of, of those that met that threshold, were any of them laid off? So there were, uh, among the, the adjuncts who were non-reappointed, there were adjuncts who would have been eligible for um, consideration for new three-year appointments. So no one in the midst of a three-year appointment was um, uh, non-reappointed. So the way the program was structured, it was initially structured as a five-year pilot, and then in the last contract, we extended it three more years. So for example, that first cohort of people, the folks who went in in the first year, were eligible for reconsideration for new three-year appointments. And there would have been some folks in the non-reappointed group who would, yes, have been three-year adjuncts, who would not have received new three-year appointments, again, based on the assessments of the fiscal and programmatic needs of the colleges at the time last spring. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously that meant that the program itself was uh, uh, was retroactive, right? Because of the, the three-year time frame. Uh, we started the program, I'm going to try and do this off from my memory, Chair Miller. We started the program, I think, three or four years ago in the contract prior to the one we settled last October or November. I believe the first year for the three-year pilot appointments was the 2016-17 academic year. So uh, folks would have worked 2016-17, 17-18, 18, 19, um, so then it might have been the second cohort coming up for review. It would have been folks who had completed three years, mm -hmm. but were up for reconsideration because what we, when we agreed to the pilot, we agreed that even if the pilot were gonna end, that if folks were in the middle of it, in the middle of their three years, when the pilot okay. ended, they would continue 
So okay. it was not, if I'm understanding your question, it wasn't so much um, retroactive. It was that this goes back to an earlier contract. The prior, the prior contract. Okay. Yes. And, and, and of those folks, uh, how many of those are within that 2000, whatever the number was that qualify for, for health benefits? How many of the folks who qualified for health benefits were three-year adjuncts? I'm going to have to get back to you with that okay. break. So of, of the 12,000 adjuncts, you said 2,000-something qualified for or had uh, a health benefit, employee health benefits. 22,2400 order of magnitude. That's a, 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 a pretty small percentage of, of the, the total uh, workforce, adjunct workforce. Um, and and I, I would assume that is um, in relation to uh, collective bargaining that, or just the time, the amount of time. What is, what is the qualifying factor for help? I, thank you. I, I really would, I'd like to explain this. I. Um, and I see President Bowen on my screen. President Bowen and I spent a lot of time over years uh, negotiating this program that, that I personally and the university are very proud of for adjunct health insurance. So prior to this program, um, the adjuncts were provided health insurance through the union's welfare fund and there were financial constraints as a result. And so uh, what is now several or many years ago, the university working with the union and the state and the city were able to both secure additional funding and secure the city's um, willingness to have us move eligible adjuncts into the city health benefits program. The city for a long time um, uh, wasn't in the right place and it took a lot of, of advocacy and lobbying, but we got the city to agree um, and actually, I think this predates this mayoral administration, as I think about it. Um, we got the city to agree that we could move eligible adjuncts into the program. We got additional funding from the state and we negotiated, yes, as a result of collective bargaining, the university and the union negotiated the eligibility criteria for those adjuncts who would be eligible for health insurance. and. The shortened version is that an adjunct has to be teaching in their third semester. So in effect, there's a waiting period. So you have to be in your third semester and you have to be teaching a minimum of, um, I forget whether it's worded as six credits or two courses, but the equivalent of two courses and in your third semester, and you have to have no other health insurance. You have to certify that you don't have other health insurance. And you know these were all, um, negotiated and in truth they were all approved by the city because the city has strict limitations on the part-time employees that it allows to be in the health benefits program. You have to be working at least half time. So in a 40 hour title, you've got to be working 20 hours a week in a 35 hour title, 17 and a half hours. And so we needed to, to um, have their support to move what are part-time employees into the health benefits program. And those were the criteria that we negotiated and the city endorsed. Okay. So that does seem like a, a, a low number of, out of 12,000 that would be working of that amount of time. So uh, I, I guess I'm to assume that they are working less than the prescribed 20 or 17 and a half hours. Uh, that being said, I would like to focus on them a little bit and, uh, and, of those 22 to 2400, 400 have lost those benefits. Yes, approximately. Yes, I, that is that is approximate. That that. And and when when we say loss, does that mean they no longer have access because they're not purchasing Cobra, or is how, how does that work? Who's paying the premium? Right. So, um, so for the folks who were were going to lose their their CUNY employment, um, some would have had health coverage through July. So, adjuncts who taught in the spring would have coverage through July. Adjuncts who taught both in the fall and the spring 
would have have uh, paid for health coverage through this summer, and then they would be eligible to self-purchase COBRA. Again, requirement of the city program, not CUNY. So they, they could have access to the same um, level of health insurance and their continu continuity of providers, but it would, it would be pursuant to COBRA. And, and what's the cost of COBRA for individual and family? You know. So, so the cost of COBRA varies by the health insurance option that the employee. We don't have a lot of options if they're in the city's health plan. There are very few options. Well, um, I I hear you. I think that there are folks who are in HIP. There are folks who are in GHI. There are more expensive programs yeah. through Aetna, and right. so. So the the cost is 102% of whatever the employer cost was. Again, depending on what somebody chooses, whether right. they have individual family, there's not there's not one discrete cost. The best do, way to answer do, that yeah, is say what, what is what is what is the min, min, minimum cost for for Cobra? Do you know that? Depending what whatever plan. Um I don't know the individual HIP rate off the top of my head. We can get you. That's probably the least expensive is the HIP program. Yeah. We will get you the individual right. HIP cost. Um, so that leads me to, and I, and I want to wrap so so our, our colleagues could ask questions, but it, it, it does lead me into uh, those who were not reappointed. And, and, and are we, in some cases, are these just, Re, uh, 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 non reappointments or, or have you guys uh, termed it, labeled it as, as layoffs? Have there been any layoffs? No, so, these, oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. Doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah no, uh, Chair Miller, these are non reappointments. Um, there have been no layoffs, um, there's, but there has been the non reappointments of, of, the, um, of the adjuncts. So, so, uh, so this put back the labor relation hat back on and, and um, by, by, by not reappointing as opposed to uh, uh, laying off that negates the, the, the kind of the impact bargaining of, of, of the bargaining unit and, and whether or not we're going to be responsible. How, how do we uh, kind of mitigate the blow? To the bargaining unit, and and you know that's that that is standardized negotiations that occur when we, we when we have layoffs. Um, are we right. not doing that? Are we are are we um, not necessarily uh, that is semantics? But are we are we uh, continuing to uh, impact bargaining for a lack of of, of better uh, words uh, with? PSC to make sure that that those that are impacted are being compensated or assisted in some shape, form, or fashion, um, uh, including. Uh, I, I know you talked about uh, professional development uh, and transitioning uh, to to uh, distance learning um, and and compensation that has occurred, but throughout this process, how much engagement. Um, has occurred uh, with the PSC, how much ongoing uh, engagement, but in particular um, for those that have uh, not uh, been reappointed, um, what does that look like? So we did throughout the spring and summer, we had impact bargaining sessions with the PSC. Um, we had, you know, several, I, half a dozen, a dozen sessions. I don't, I don't know the exact number. The focus of those sessions was largely on adjustments to terms and conditions of employment that were necessitated as a result to the move to remote work. Mm -hmm. So um, issues related to observation, evaluation, um, we extended, we reached a mutual agreement to extend the clock for, for folks um, to do their scholarship and research to get tenure. We agreed to carry over vacation time. So there, there was bargaining throughout the spring and the summer. We indicated to PSC a willingness to continue impact bargaining, 
to review proposals that that they may be um, uh, interested in putting forth and we remain committed and willing to engage in impact bargaining. Okay, so it's good to hear that it, it is ongoing and and um, and perhaps uh, the, the outcome of, of the hearing itself would, would be helpful um, as, as we move forward to kind of further address some of those issues that that come up that we had not anticipated um, as we move forward. So I'll, I'll definitely jump in on the second round. Right now, I'll pass it off back off to Chair Barron to hear from uh, some of our colleagues that are, have assembled this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Miller. And at this point, I still have questions, but I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by other council members. Council Member Moya has joined us and Council Member Rosenthal has joined. And I believe that Council Member Rosenthal has questions. So I will at this point allow her to ask her questions and I'll give it to Chloe to be able to confirm how we're going to proceed. You have it, you have it Chair Barron. Um, you may ask, begin your questions. Oh, sorry. Yes, it's Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, um, Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raise hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also, please remember to keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock. You may begin after the Sergeant calls, after I call on you and the Sergeant gives you the cue, we will now hear questions from Council Member Rosenthal. Member Rosenthal, the time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to CUNY and to both of the co-chairs, um, really appreciate this hearing. And the co-chairs covered so many of my questions, um, but I have just a few remaining in addition. Um, I really appreciate them so much. So CUNY, you, um, to both of you, you mentioned in uh, an agreement with the union on adjunct non-reappointments, which is, such a strange phrase, um, you know, we, the, it's a double negative and it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around what that means. Um, but included in it was a provision to protect adjuncts on health insurance and the three-year appointments. You spoke about that a little bit. Did you, how did you, did you and how did you ensure compliance with that agreement? So the presidents were told, it was com communicated to the presidents by the chancellor that in making their decisions and reviewing what needed to be reviewed, they were to prioritize, there were, there were really two issues to prioritize and you know they might've even been a little competing. But they were, I don't have the agreement in front of me. I think, I think we use the word prioritize. They were to both prioritize um, uh, folks coming up for three-year appointments and similarly prioritize folks who would lose health insurance. And so the presidents were told that as part of their review, those um, principles were to be prioritized. But at the same time, their review, for example, on the three-year adjunct appointments includes, in addition to folks meeting the service requirements, includes an assessment of the fiscal and programmatic needs of the department. And in thinking about that, they need to be able to project forward for the three years because they're making a three-year commitment. So that, the, you, that was entrusted to the presidents. Yeah, did, you, did a flag go off for you about Medgar Evers College. You know that at that location, every single adjunct eligible for the three-year appointment was laid off, non-reappointed, but laid off. Did that raise a red flag for you at all? I was actually, I believe it was the president of the union who brought that to to my attention in the spring. And? And? Have you followed up on that in any way? I mean, she if she brought that to your attention, 
in the spring. That's half a year ago, at least. So yeah. what was your follow-up with MedGrovers? Because that seems like a pretty blatant move, right? So there, there, were, there were some discussions with the college at the time, but as I said, the decisions regarding staffing and employment, including who to reappoint and not- Let me ask you this question. Did you hear from the college all of the efforts? What other efforts did they make before having to do these specific layoffs? Because doesn't so, it strike you as odd or, or does it not raise a red flag for you? Maybe this is a usual thing, so it's not strange, but wouldn't that raise a flag? Every single adjunct eligible for the three-year contract laid off. Something, something's got it, something. I mean, that's, I'm a lay person. Come on, what, no red flags, please. I, 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 is there a question? Yes. What was your discussion with Medgar Evers? How did they explain that to you? So they were not, they were not asked by me. Then how do you know that they made every effort not to do that? As I said, the presidents were told what to prioritize. They are entrusted to manage their schools. So, and manage and their I have to tell you, this gets to my overall question with, uh, I, I don't appreciate your non-answer. I heard you, but just like a non-appointment, that was a non-answer. Um, and, and let me just say what I was very disappointed and, and particularly you, Mr. Speranza, obviously, obviously the world is in a crisis. Like you don't need half your testimony to tell us that uh, there's a terrible thing going on, right? That takes a sentence. And then you tell us that for that reason, you're losing all this support, right? Of course. I mean, I had to help negotiate the city's budget in June, right? You don't need to tell us that. But what you didn't tell us was all the steps you took first that was the lowest hanging fruit prior to having to lay off people. So in other words, CUNY added to the unemployment problem in New York City, right? I, I, you didn't talk about things like, well, if the campus isn't open, you don't need toilet paper. You don't need as much paper. What was the lowest hanging fruit where you were able to get savings right away? The no brainer stuff. Well, um, my, my last name is pronounced Sapienza, but I Apologies. wanted it, that, 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 was, that names. I really apologize. No, no worries. You're not, you're not the first one. You won't be the last. Um, the, um, I, I did touch on that in my testimony about other things that we were doing. Um, and certainly we had savings um, from the fact that we went to distance learning um, in terms of um, not having to, to make the, the purchases that we normally do. Um, we eliminated all travel costs. Um, we had some savings from energy costs, obviously. So there's a host of things that we did um, How in, much in advance. Was that but again, as, as I mentioned How in my test, how much was that worth? What was the dollar value of that? It's it's very minimal um, because is it, it you know, ten dollars? Is it a hundred dollars? I just want to hear from the energy you. savings was about six million dollars. Um, in terms of purchasing savings, we had some purchasing savings, but again, we we they, we went to distance education in mid March. And so we, we had a few months of that, but keep in mind that our budget also was reduced by the city of New York for our community colleges by $20 right. million dollars in the last quarter of the year. So those, save, so those savings went towards that target. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, look, we're all having it rough and it's yep. your job to figure out how to do this. I get that. Um, so I just wanna know how hard, how 
much you pushed, how much low hanging fruit was there before you had to do the drastic step of adding to the city's unemployment issue and not helping students more. I mean, if there's one thing I've heard from CUNY students is how much they've been disenfranchised, how many suffered because of the terrible lack of planning uh, with closing the campuses and then were you letting students stay or not? So many lives were disrupted during this period. And we're talking about young people. So people who are juggling so much. And I still don't know what, uh, what steps, what thoughtful steps you're doing going forward that'll get you meaningful savings. We're in such a different place today than we were in March. You know, uh, I, there, there's no love lost between me and this presidential administration, but the guidance to you from the Department of Education was correct. How are you gonna do this smart? And it's not, it's your job. Don't, you don't, you know, I'm sorry. If you think it's hard, that's interesting, but of course you have to show the receipts when you get the money from the federal government, that's your job. But they, what are you doing at a time when substantial savings could be made that would not affect students or faculty to get those savings. So I'll I'll, I'll list the items that we've done. Um, and so the dollar far. value. I appreciate okay. the dollar value. Sure. I mean, well, first of all, we did not raise tuition for the fall semester, um, and so that was uh, something. There was that, an add-on fee, though, that I think um, was there was no there was no additional fee for the fall semester. Um, and our okay, budget request. Not, students have told me something different, but I don't have the specifics. I'll get back to you. No, no, that's fine. And, and, and part, part of the confusion may be I in our budget. I think it was that they had to pay their student fee, but they weren't going to get anything out of their student fee. It was something like that. The student activity fee waiver um, was, um, was a, there was a partial, a student activity fee payment, I should say, there was a partial waiver in the spring semester for students pay that in the fall semester. Right, um, just to be clear, I mean, these are students who hardly have money for a meal, but go ahead. So we have a we instituted a hiring freeze immediately um, in April, and we have reduced 468 positions, which has saved 33 million dollars. Um, so there was that. And um, went through the vacancy committee, right, to review correct. those vacancies, right? So hypothetically, it could have even did the did the layoffs at Megar Evers go through the vacancy committee as well? when you say the layoffs, uh, what are you referring to? Because we haven't done layoffs. At the adjuncts, your the layoffs. Adjunct non -reappointment, the adjunct non-reappointment. None of the adjunct non-reappointments <laughs> at any college went through. Non-reappointment means layoff. I, I mean, if you want to have a specialized vocabulary with the people you work with, that's fine. But to a, a human being, it's a layoff. So you're saying none of the layoffs of the adjuncts at Medgar Evers went through the vacancy review committee? None of those adjunct decisions went through the vacancy review committee. That's correct. They were done by the presidents. Do you know, are you comfortable that the presidents had a vacancy review committee among their, in their office? Part of the, part of the announcement when we created the University Vacancy Review Committee was that each college um, should um, create their own vacancy review committee if they didn't have one already. Many of them already had them in place. Does Medgar Evans ever have one? My understanding is they do. And is it your understanding that all the layoffs there went through the vacancy review committee or is it just for central office? Um, I don't know about specifically about Medgar Evans. We'd have to confirm that and get back to. We, I think it's really important to the committee that you come back to us with an understanding of how you reviewed the savings due to layoffs at Medgar Evers, right? And how you uh, understood that they had made every effort 
before these layoffs happened. Can you come back to the committee with that? We will. The, is that a, will that take a long time? Like the committee? It should not, no. Okay, so I leave that to the chairs and the staff. Thank you very much. Thank you for the extended time, chairs. Uh, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much. And your kind of question, in fact, extends my opening question to the panel about who was involved in making the council decision. Member, council Member Barron, uh, your microphone. Oh, okay. Can you hear me Thank now? Thank you. Okay, those yes. papers. Yes, uh, the extended line of questioning from Councilmember Rosenthal was in fact my opening question to the panel in terms of the uh, non reappointments of adjuncts who made that decision. And if there were department heads who in fact wanted to retain personnel for various reasons as you've highlighted course offerings number of students enrollments or whatever. How was that considered and was that a determining factor because I am concerned about the role of the presidents and whether or not there is any kind of transparency or accountability in the decisions that presidents are making as to who will not be reappointed. So I'm glad that my colleague extended that line of questioning and pursued it even more deeply than my opening question. So we're glad for that and we look forward to the responses to that. And if in fact, there is some measure of inequity or some measure of some personal uh, considerations as to whether or not a person was reappointed, what recourse do those individuals have? Well, I, I guess that's directed at me. Um, so, so to the extent that someone feels that they were treated outside the bounds of the contract or the law, they have those options available to them. To the extent that they think that, you know, they just weren't treated well um, or nicely, then they presumably can go back to the chair and try again. There is local union representation at the colleges. They can consult with their local union representatives and determine whether there is a course of action for them. Um, so those, those would be the options, Chair Barron. Okay. Uh, I have my second round of questions and then I will ask my co-chair for his second round of questions and then any other colleagues that may have questions. Uh, first, let me ask uh, Ms. Rivera, are there other members who have raised their hands for questions? Before I no, begin. not at this time. Uh, just a reminder that uh, council members may use the raise hand function in Zoom in order to uh, indicate that they have a question for this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I apologize. I've been juggling my papers, but I'm going to be mindful to keep them to the side. Uh, and regarding the CARES Act, the Federal CARES Act generally provided funds for universities half of which had to be allocated to students. And CUNY has allocated approximately 236 million for the purposes of the students, half of which 118 million have, some have argued could have been used to retain adjunct faculty. Because certainly we're talking now about the impact on students because courses are not being offered. Why hasn't CUNY used these funds to reduce the fall 2020 adjunct faculty layoff? So a couple things on that, Chair Barron, if I may. One is, um, as you pointed out, the first tranche of money that we got from the CARES allocation, 118 million was for student emergency grants. Um, we moved very quickly in getting that money out to the students. I think as of last check, which was a couple of days ago, I think we only had about $700,000 that was remaining to be allocated. So we've, we've distributed in a very short time Hundred seventeen million, over one hundred seventeen million dollars to students, and one hundred and ninety-seven thousand students have benefited from that. Um, the second tranche of money, which was a, a mirror image of that one hundred eighteen for students, was what they call uh, the institutional aid. And again, it was laid out by each specific, each particular campus in CUNY received a specific amount. 
the same amount that they received for the students. The US Department of Ed, um, which is administering this grant, does have specific guidelines regarding the use of these funds. They're, they're mainly um, to be used, as I mentioned in my testimony, for things that are related to the move for distance education and for helping students along um, with any um, additional costs that they have may, may have incurred. Um, so again, our plan is, and we've given out 41 million of, of those funds already, um, but our plan is a very student focused plan. We want to try to use that money to help students in the best way possible um, so that they can continue their education and that um, our enrollment doesn't continue to, to go down and that we could retain students and recruit new ones. Um, and the benefit of that will be if, uh, if we can maintain our enrollment or grow our enrollment, we will have the need for um, hiring back um, or hiring more additional um, faculty. So the CARES money doesn't allow specifically to, um, to hire adjuncts. Um, however, if the move to distance learning required um, additional adjuncts to be hired, then yes, then we can use it for that. But, but our plan is very student focused and our hope there is that we can help our students for, uh, continue towards the pursuit of their degree and, and maintain our enrollment levels. So since you're, you're not indicating that in fact, that money that's remaining would be considered to be used to uh, reappoint, particularly as we're looking at the adjuncts who I did find the data who teach overall 56% uh, of the undergraduate classes. So since you're not looking to make a commitment to say that any portion of that money would be used to um, rehire, reappoint the adjuncts who have not been appointed. What can the chancellor do to look to those adjuncts as has been referenced who were uh, um, appointed, who were up for three-year contracts and who were not given those three-year contracts, particularly Mega Evans College? What can we expect that the chancellor will do on behalf of those adjuncts who feel that uh, who, according to the guidelines for this period, were not uh, given that kind of consideration? Well, I think a couple of things. One is um, that um, you know we we did make a commitment that we would try if the, if we had the need that we would hire back um, some of these adjuncts that that didn't get reappointed, and um, and and we've done that. Um, I think there were about 600 and over 650 of the of those adjuncts that were non-reappointed have been rehired since then. Um, in addition, we also received a grant from the Mellon Foundation that I just want to take a minute to, to describe because this also benefited us in terms of hiring more adjuncts. We received a $500,000 gift from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. We matched it with university funds, so there was a million dollars that became available. And the, the goal of this grant was to increase courses in the humanities. And so by using that money, we, we created 157 additional course sections for the fall semester. And we, we hired additional adjuncts to cover those courses. And so 54 of the adjuncts that were non-reappointed were hired back from the result of this grant and, and the university match of those funds. So, we are looking at, at ways and opportunities when they come up at the various campuses on a university-wide level to, to reappoint um, some of these adjuncts that were non-reappointed. Um, and so we are looking at, at ways that we can do that. And, and I also want to make note that it's not just Mega Evers College uh, where this existed, but I've also have uh, information that it's also at Bronx Community College where there were adjuncts who were recommended by their departments for three-year appointments and did not, uh, they were not offered. So I wanna make sure that both of those colleges are cited in that. I'm going to ask my co-chair if he would like to continue with his second round of questions. Uh, so I'll give it back to Ms. Rivera, thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. <clears throat> yeah. Um... 
I, I just I have a few and and I'm I'm I really want to get to our next panel, um, and I know there are a number of questions that we do have uh, left. I, I want to see also if our um, colleagues um, have something. I'd love to hear from them, uh, and and if not, then I'll I'll jump back in and ask my final question. Okay. Any, any, are there any hands raised here? No, no hands raised at this time. Thank you, uh, Chair Miller. Okay. Uh, I did have uh, some uh, final question uh, about implementation of the uh, 2017 agreement. Um, have there been any postponements on any of the provisions, compensations, or uh, uh, raises from the 2017 uh, uh, collective bargaining agreement? If so, um, you know, or do you anticipate any? And if so, have there been conversation with PSC um, about what that would look like? Sure. So, so you probably saw a couple of weeks ago that the city delayed a very significant lump sum payments to their teachers as a result of um, owing to a very old contract. They had they had hundreds of millions of dollars in payments due. Those payments were delayed. Other union payments in the city, uh, similarly, as well as payments to various funds. The state delayed their wage increases last spring. Um, they've now been delayed a few times to their employees. And so similar to the city and state actions, we have delayed the wage increases that we have due to a few unions. We have wage increases due um, both in November and December to, to a few different unions. And those wage increases are being delayed. Um, and to your question, the PSC leadership was advised of this last week. Was, was they were advised, was there negotiations uh, around this? Because certainly um, the city has not arbitrarily or overall um, withheld upcoming raises, uh, very specifically the UFT, um, but there's other areas of compensation that have occurred that allow that to happen. And so in order for that to happen, I would suspect that there once again was some form of impact bargaining happening that, you know, we can't do this, but we can do this. Um, I, I expect for those kind of conversations to happen, but also I don't think that the minimal amount of, of, of uh, compensation in comparison to that of the UFT is, is we're, we're not doing it because this is, sort of a, a reverse pattern bargain and they're doing it, we're going to do it too. Um, how do you justify um, as we move forward? What is, have we discussed and aggregated the, 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 the savings and then discussed with the union as to what has to get done? Part of that bargaining is, is, is that there may be other things that can be done in the interim that would uh, negate the need for, for look, at this time, uh, more than ever, where people have additional responsibilities, folks in households uh, are not, everybody's not working in the household that, you know, uh, the, the stream of income is not the same that, you know, people are depending on, on those negotiated wage increases. And so I would like to think um, that there are ways to certainly get around it that we're not arbitrarily doing it because it's someone else is doing it. Um, but I would also um, hope that we take a, a broader look at uh, labor relations in general throughout, you're right, whether it's PEF or, or, or the city of New York, but look at um, individual bargaining units and, and uh, see where they stand, uh, where agencies stand in their ability to really uh, um, fulfill their responsibilities. And so I, I, I just, you know, that's the easy out to say that they did that, but I will. here's what I know, is that there are so many other levels of compensation that have been negotiated uh, 
that allows that really mitigates the loss of that the, of, of of that increase. And so I hope that you guys are talking and and uh, to make sure that that happened and that and and as you indicated, yeah, we informed them. I hope that it's, it's I, I would hate to have been informed uh, when I was a union president that I wasn't uh, getting something that I negotiated on behalf of my membership. That 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 that's how that conversation uh, took place. And 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 knowing PSC that that it's probably not. Um, but again, um, I don't want this once again to be on the backs of workers and make sure that um, we're, we're talking about compensation that was already earned in in the past, uh, pre-COVID, and and now, you know, uh, folks are not uh, receiving that now. So we're, we're very much con concerned about that as we move forward. But uh, just want to make sure that the dialogue and the transparency is there so that uh, Barbara and her team is satisfied that this is happening in a, in a, in a very uh, transparent way. And, uh, and, and, and this way, beyond what we're doing now, we, we don't have to weigh in again in the future, but we will. So, um, you know, I, I just want to, uh, I want to leave it at that. I, I do want to speak with the other panelists and want to hear from my colleagues. So thank you both so very much uh, for your testimony, your candor, and, uh, and for the work that you guys are doing with our most precious resource. No, it is not easy. Uh, and uh, I speak with our uh, local presidents on a pretty regular basis. Um, and it is a partnership. It is an absolute partnership that we have here. Um, but, you know, we, we, we say here that, you know, it's the teamwork that makes the dream work, but that is, you know, we, we have to sometimes do this or whether we're doing it in informal setting and, 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 and sometimes it has to be this so that the world knows that, that we are working really hard to, to serve our, our academic community um, and those who provide those critical services. Um, and there are assumptions that, you know, uh, CUNY faculty um, and, and including uh, and not limited to uh, the adjuncts just make it so seamless and all of our public servants and, and how services get delivered and, and, uh, and as I said, make the quality of life for so many New Yorkers so seamless that we take, take them for granted. And I just don't, you know, I, I want people to really appreciate uh, what these folks do uh, to enhance the educational experience of so many here in this city. So, thank you. Thanks, Chair Miller. And, and this, in closing, I want to say sincere thanks to the City Council for their continued strong support for CUNY. And, um, and again, um, you know, recognition of the, of the great work that our faculty has done um, in, in pivoting so quickly to distance learning and continuing to serve our students so well. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, and, and just in hindsight, uh, Council Member Barron, we, yes. I, I think we got arrested a few times so that they get a raise, right? We're not, that, let that not be in vain, okay? <laughs> let that not be in vain, give them their money. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Just to wrap up, just to wrap up. Oh, sorry, Chair Barron, I'm sorry. Yes, just to wrap up, uh, one final concluding remarks I want to make. Uh, what percentage of the adjunct faculty are black, brown, or the uh, so-called underrepresented minorities? What percent of the faculty, adjunct faculty, is black, brown, and other so-called minorities? I, I am sorry, Chair Baron. I don't have that data with me, but it's obviously data that you know, the university I'm has. That question, you know, I'm always concerned <laughs> about the specifics and the subgroups, but I would imagine yes. that it's a, a large percentage and I would look forward to that data. And, and so now we're seeing another impact of COVID. We know that COVID has exposed much of the racial inequities that exist in our society. And now here with this a uh, large number of uh, adjuncts who have not been reappointed or slash laid off. We're contributing and in fact, 
exacerbating that same problem of blacks and browns and other underrepresented minorities not getting their fair share and in fact bearing a larger brunt of the oppressive conditions during this economic and health uh, situation. So we need to again factor that in and understand how that's contributing also to the inequities that we see in, in this system of, of racial inequity. And I also want to again have you consider how we can use the CARES money in a way that benefits students as well as faculty by hiring the adjuncts, because we know the class sizes have expanded tremendously. We didn't talk about that, but the increased now load of, of instructors, adjunct instructors and other instructors to have expanded class size, and that's another burden. And then finally, I do want to say that uh, the agreement that CUNY signed with PSC last spring specified that the chancellor would direct colleges to make every effort to maintain employment for adjuncts eligible for the three-year appointments and adjuncts on CUNY's health insurance. And we want to know how the chancellor is holding those presidents responsible to his directives. We want an answer to that as well. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Rivera, are there any other members that may have been overlooked that have questions? No, there are no raised hands in Zoom at the moment, seeing no other council members waiting to ask questions. Uh, we have concluded CUNY's testimony and we can turn to public testimony. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. So first I'd like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three min minutes. Note that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin starting your testimony. Um, the first panel in order of speaking will include Barbara Bowen, President of the Professional Staff Congress at CUNY, Rosa Skillicote, Vice President for Part-Time Personnel at PSC CUNY, Blanca Vasquez, Executive Council Member for the Part-Time Personnel at PSC CUNY, Robert Farrell, Chapter Chair at PSC uh, CUNY, and Scott Kelly, Chapter Chair at PSC CUNY. I will now, now call on PSC President Bowen. Time starts now. Can you start my clock again, please? I hadn't gotten the signal to unmute. Okay? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon and thank you so much, uh, committee chairs on higher education and civil service and labor and council members, uh, really fabulous job today. And obviously from what you've said today, it's so clear that oversight is needed. Um, there's a lot to say in response to what's been said already. Uh, I just want to correct a couple of things. Um, when we speak about layoffs, the union uses that term, even though we understand that someone's technical appointment may have ended. When somebody has worked at CUNY for a decade or 20 years, and then they are suddenly non-reappointed, that is a layoff. CUNY can't have it both ways and make adjuncts the mainstay of the teaching force, and then suddenly they're disposable when it's time for layoffs. Also, we did not get the numbers of layoffs by colleges. We got the numbers of adjuncts uh, who were not up for a renewal health insurance. So it's important that we heard them today. Um, I'll just say briefly that higher education in general has one of the worst labor systems of any industry. And I would say certainly the worst in the professions. But even within this disgraceful national system, CUNY is an outlier for successive and growing use of part-time labor. And I just want to emphasize, and this has come up, that CUNY adjuncts are both part-time and contingent. Their work is not full-time and they don't have the full protections of tenure or permanence. Uh, CUNY's system really is a disgrace and it has everything to do with racist disinvestment. And then I would have to say that it is reinforced by institutional silence on what's going on. And ultimately the use of the adjunct system, as we've pointed out today, undermines our students. 
because students, when they have 55 or 56 of their percent of their classes taught by people who do not have the security of a permanent appointment, who do not in some cases have an office, who do not have adequate pay, those people cannot serve the students in the way they need to be served. And CUNY's budget strategy, and this is the important part for me, CUNY's budget strategy in the face of cuts. Yes, we know there have been cuts and I would say racist disinvestment in CUNY for 35 or more years. CUNY's strategy, rather than resisting and showing that CUNY cannot do what it must do on that small amount of money, CUNY's strategy has been to cut their biggest cost, labor, and replace full-time positions with part-time positions. That's what they have done. And by doing that, they provide a glide path, an easy pathway for applying more cuts because CUNY has made it possible to create the illusion that we can still do what we should do just with part-time faculty. Um, and I wanna show you something, I hope it comes up on the screen. Um, this is a chart that shows the uh, percentage of full-time and part-time employees at CUNY in the different categories. The one that's all blue, can you see it? Yeah, um, represents the uh, executive compensation. That's the management. And you'll notice that in management, 100% of the employees are full-time. In the other two categories, instructional and non-instructional or classified, rather, um, it's about half who are part-time. So when managers set up their own provisions and their own work, they make sure they are 100% full-time, but the rest of us are half part-time. And worse, the trend is toward increasing, not decreasing, but increasing the reliance on part-time and contingent labor. In 2000, CUNY had 5,500 full-time faculty and 6,200 part-time. In 2020, uh, that number has gone up to 12,000 part-time. And also at the same time, and, and you should be um, aware of this, that CUNY is also increasingly part-timing the professional staff. There are now about 2,000 people in the professional staff that would be uh, people working in libraries, people working on uh, counseling, those are part-time too. Um, and I have to say that under Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, even though I, I certainly appreciate what Pam Silverblatt said, and she was a great negotiating partner on the health insurance and worked very hard for that. But I have to say under Chancellor uh, Matos Rodriguez, um, things in some ways have gotten worse. Number one, CUNY rushed to lay off adjuncts in June, even before the cuts were applied. And that revealed the deep structural problem of contingency, that contingency makes it convenient to lay people off while presenting that as simply ending their appointment. Two, so CUNY exploited that structure in a moment of danger for the whole institution, instead of holding on to those folks for our students, what's more important for students than to keep their faculty in the classroom? Um, instead of doing that, CUNY exploited an already bad system to allow them to do mass layoffs. Um, and I think it's important that, uh, and third, I would say CUNY did not use the CARES Act money to keep those adjuncts employed. When uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza talked about the guidance from the Department of Ed on the CARES Act money, he left out the provision in the law itself, not just guidance, that says that every uh, that to the extent practicable, institutions that receive CARES Act money should keep employees on payroll. The cost of keeping the laid off adjuncts on payroll was about $30 million, would have been. Instead, CUNY is sitting on that CARES Act money and has not used it to keep adjuncts on payroll. Next, as we've heard earlier, CUNY failed to ensure adherence with their agreement to protect adjuncts on health insurance to the greatest extent they could and those eligible for three-year appointments. And now they are stonewalling and not even providing to the union the names of those who've been laid off. So as you said, um, you know, we would like to reach out to them, work with them, help them. We have spent months trying to get that data. So to finish up, I want to say to the chairs, what we thank you so much for the questions and the concerns you've raised. Everyone knows this is a difficult time. We all know that, but a budget is choices and there are choices of what to do in a budget shortfall. CUNY has rushed to lay off adjuncts who are already extremely vulnerable. I would propose humbly that the council give CUNY a one week deadline to produce the names of the adjuncts laid off in the spring and those who were re reappointed. 
and those who lost their health insurance one week. I would demand that CUNY use a relatively small share of the remaining Institutional Cares Act money, which is allowed to be used, and there's guidance to use it this way, and put those adjuncts back on payroll. Um, and instead of, I don't know, accepting the views of the perhaps the governor, the governor's budget director, who is of course on CUNY's board. Next, I would call on you as the uh, council chairs, um, the committee chairs, to demand an account, and I think you have done this already today, of how the chancellor held colleges to the June 30th agreement about protecting adjuncts who were eligible and recommended. Those adjuncts at Medgar Evers where students desperately need their guidance and help and support were recommended by their departments after a serious review and years of service, and yet the college laid them all off. Um, I would urge you also to call on CUNY to bargain with the union, as, as you've mentioned, Danique, uh, council chair, um, to bargain on the impact of changes in class size and on class size itself. CUNY refuses to bargain on class size. That is the key workload issue. And finally, I would ask you, and I think you have done this magnificently, and that is to demand that CUNY, as an institution that could be a beacon could be a leader at this moment, could be a leader when finally people are realizing that black lives matter. Finally, we have not Trump, well soon not in the White House. This is a moment where CUNY could step out and lead and say, we must have more money in Albany. There must be new revenue bills. The governor must support new revenue bills, not just hope for a stimulus. And CUNY must stop providing a too easy way to disguise the crushing impact on the individual employees and on our students of just absorbing more and more and more disinvestment by providing an easy out saying we'll just make more and more people part-time and we'll underpay them. That is disgraceful. This is not the moment to stand down. It's the moment to stand up and I call on CUNY to do that and I know the council will join me in that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, President Bowen. Uh, before I call on the next witness, I would like to recognize that we have been joined by Majority Leader Cumbo and Council Member Drum. Uh, now, Vice President Squillicote, you may begin once a member of our staff unmutes you and the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, council members, and thank you for your time today. My name is Rosa Squillicote. I'm the Vice President of Part-Time Personnel. Um, I've been an adjunct for almost nine years, and I'm also actually a graduate of Hunter College, where the majority of my classes were taught by adjuncts. It is not an exaggeration to say that CUNY runs on adjunct and part-time labor. CUNY relies disproportionately on adjuncts to teach classes, as well as part-time workers like non-teaching adjuncts, continuing education teachers, and college laboratory technicians. All these people, almost half the CUNY workforce, work tirelessly to provide support and a world-class education for our working class students and students of color. You don't become an adjunct at CUNY unless you care about your students. What we need, what adjuncts need, are better working conditions and protections so that we can provide the educational and emotional support our students need by helping with difficult coursework, making time to listen to students' concerns, or connecting students to other resources that they may need. Every adjunct knows students who have experienced the death of a family member or faced job loss or become sick themselves during the COVID pandemic. We cannot support our students if we ourselves are worried about losing our jobs and health insurance, or if we are juggling five, 10, 20 or more students a class, which by the way, best practices for online teaching suggest about 12 students a class. Part-timers at CUNY deserve to be recognized and respected for the work we do to make CUNY what it is, and yet we are treated as disposable. We, we are neither paid sufficiently for our work nor given job security. In fact, as we've heard, CUNY administration made the decision to lay off almost 3,000 part-time workers in the immediate aftermath of the COVID pandemic. 
Thanks to the union's advocacy, some workers were able to regain their jobs, but many others are left without income and without any insurance during one of the most serious health and economic crises of our time. And COBRA is simply not a financial option for many adjuncts, as the cheapest option is about $900 a month. I mean, and then on top of this, at Medgar Evers and Bronx Community College, CUNY fired dozens of adjuncts who had been offered a three-year contract, which is one of the few source, sources of job security that is available to adjuncts. This is an insult both to workers and the union. We are demanding that laid off part-time workers get their jobs and health insurance back. CUNY administration would have us believe that they are strapped for cash, but among you know, the CARES Act money, which they could use to preserve jobs, other uni university administrators have taken meaningful pay cuts, more than like a five-day furlough, that have allowed their universities to continue to function. We have seen no such decency from CUNY. More generally, part-timers simply I'm need to fired. be paid a decent wage. If I were to work as a full-time adjunct, and I make on the higher range of what adjuncts make, teaching six classes a year, I would only make $30,000 pre-tax. And that's despite the fact that I have a law degree and a family to provide for. Adjuncts should be given, at least paid at least $7,000 a class, should have meaningful job security, and should be given the ability tra to transition to a full-time position. What CUNY really needs, and specifically what the workers and students need, is a free and fully funded CUNY. It is past time to invest in public institutions like CUNY through legislation like the Millionaire's Tax and the New Deal for CUNY. Our dignity and safety demand it, New York's recovery demands it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Executive Council Member Vasquez. Time starts now. All right. Have I been called on? Yes, you may begin. Right. Okay. All right. So let me be quick. Um, I'm Blanca Vasquez. I'm a retired, actually, now adjunct at Hunter College, and I'm on the PSC Executive Council. Um, I have to contradict what the Vice Chancellor Silverblatt said about where these cuts start. Just last week at Hunter, we got we began to get these alarming emails from adjuncts about increases in class sizes and cuts. The directives came from the top, right? Chairs were ordered to, in English, cut, cancel two sections and raise caps on remaining sections to 28 for a 100 class. For a 200 class, cancel 11 sections and hold an additional three as tentative, raise caps to 30. Class sizes are being raised in English composition classes, which are very labor intensive for adjuncts. So here's what adjuncts are reporting. One says uh, a music class that the student cap in his course or her course doubled, going from more than doubled, going from 35 to 80. Another reports that his two lab classes were combined into one and another increased from 25 to 40. Quote, all these increases are basically making me teach double the students for half the pay I should be receiving. And Adjunct notes that this is wrong on so many levels, and we worry about what effect these increases will have on students' GPA, on retention, and on graduation rates, and ultimately on mission at CUNY, right, which is to educate students. New Yorkers don't know that this is happening and how quickly our working conditions are being eroded. As everybody's noted, right, um, this pandemic has exacerbated all the racial equities in American history, right? And it's falling hardest on those at the bottom. Here we go at CUNY. Cuts at CUNY are falling hardest on the lowest tier of CUNY's labor structure, right? The part-time faculty that teach the majority of courses. They've also fallen on college assistants, CLTs, and non-teaching adjuncts who are the support system for all of our classes. And they make a difference, right? Healthcare. Right from the start, we've urged CUNY to protect healthcare. They haven't. By the way, I don't understand how all of a sudden colleges are independent fiefdoms, right? So that John Jay can do whatever it wants, and CUNY administration has kind of no responsibility for policy and for implementing policy that they put in writing to the colleges. I mean, all of a sudden, colleges. <laughs> 
Uh, so I don't understand that. That's not management. <clears throat> All right. So here we are. Exploitation. Right? What CUNY has chosen to do is to super exploit the already exploited. Right? And, I'm, and, and the problem with class size is not only that it exploits the laborer, right? the worker, you know, but what is it doing to students? I am so concerned about that. This isn't the time, right? This is not the time to retrench at CUNY. This is not the time to make it more difficult for our students to be there. CUNY is actually more important than ever. So what we're urging city council and the state and everybody else is that CUNY is a priority. You know, higher education is a priority. You know, it's not, it's not just get a better job. I mean, it's the only way that most of us will move from the working class to the middle class. That's CUNY's mission. That's what makes CUNY unique. So this is about, yes, new deal for CUNY, you know, because we're in that kind of dire circumstances, you know, where we have to create a new deal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chapter Chair Farrell. Time starts now. So thank you council members for this hearing. I'm Robert Farrell, PSC Chapter Chair at Lehman College. And I'm here to speak about the situation of non-teaching adjuncts, NTAs in CUNY, specifically those in the CUNY libraries. As SVP Sapienza noted, uh, and I wish he was still here, NTAs perform work identical to full-time faculty in their areas, including counseling, advising, and librarianship. Yet NTAs are paid at an extremely low rate, 60%, not of their full-time peers, but of teaching adjuncts who themselves make a fraction of full-time wages. Many of these employees are in the academic gig economy and so in desperate need of even this form of exploitative employment to survive. In the libraries, NTAs provide essential reference instruction and other library services. As full-time staffing levels have dropped and as the hiring freeze has been extended, NTAs have been essential in maintaining any semblance of normal service levels for the CUNY students and faculty who depend on the libraries for their academic and scholarly success. Additionally, they have been at the heart of CUNY's open educational resources, OER initiatives, uh, that saved uh, students hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But as a result of CUNY's voluntary and unnecessary decision to follow Betsy DeVos's optional guidance and the university's failure to act independently to use CARES Act money to keep workers on payroll as Congress intended, many NTAs have had their hours cut. Many have been left scrambling trying to find enough hours to keep their health insurance. NTAs were one of several titles in the PSC to experience harrowing month-to-month -month employment prior to CUNY adopting a temporary budget, and they may be in that position again going forward. The precarity of our adjuncts um, is already terrible, and the level of precarity inflicted on them in recent months is wholly unacceptable. It must not happen again. In addition to having hours cut and receiving monthly contracts, some NTAs were from the onset of the semester only given work until the end of October and are now not receiving a paycheck. Other library NTAs, particularly those working in the area of OER, were reappointed but still haven't been called back to work due to state allocated OER funding not having yet come through, part of the additional austerity CUNY is experiencing. It's shameful that the most vulnerable employees in CUNY are bearing the brunt of CUNY's divorce guided choices. It bears noting that despite the current crisis, CUNY enrollment is near an all time high. We need investment in CUNY, not only to keep our NTAs on the job and in the service of our students, but as Rosa mentioned, so that we can fill full-time vacancies with these amazing uh, faculty and grow our services to meet the needs of our record-breaking enrollments. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Chapter Chair Callie. Time starts now. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Callie, and I'm a professor of theater and chair of the Professional Staff Congress chapter at Kingsborough Community College. This past summer, more than 100 part time positions were eliminated at Kingsborough, and many others have had their hours severely curtailed. Among these positions were advisors, laboratory technicians, library assistants, and other student support positions. Some of these people had worked at Kingsborough for more than 20 years, and some of them were given less than 10 hours of notice that their employment was ending. 
10 hours for 20 years. That is unforgivable. No committee or any other form of shared governance were consulted in the decisions to non-reappoint at KCC. The comments of the CUNY Chancellery notwithstanding, that did not happen at Kingsborough, I can confirm. Chair Barron, your concerns about transparency and accountability of the college presidents are very well founded because there is almost none. They certainly aren't receiving it from CUNY Central. I can only hope that our elected officials will exercise the oversight necessary that CUNY management has abrogated of the colleges. Community college students are among the most disadvantaged in New York City, and they're the least prepared for college. They need more individualized attention, not less. They're more likely to have special needs. They're more likely to be underprepared. They're more likely to be housing and food insecure. They are more likely to have connectivity issues in connecting to their online classes. And yes, they are more likely to be black and brown. CUNY is making up for lost adjuncts by crowding students into larger classes. Another answer to your question, Chair Barron, on how are these courses being replaced that CUNY did not answer, they're just jamming the students into bigger classes. That's how they're doing it. How are they doing it? They are lowering the quality of the education for classes that were already too big. I'll give you a case in point. For the spring 2021 semester upcoming, English Composition I classes at Kingsborough are capped at 29 students, whereby at Baruch, the same English Comp classes are capped at only 15 students. I asked the council to consider the following question. Why is it that CUNY sets course caps at one of its flagship campuses in line with national norms, yet has no problem with crowding Kingsborough students into classes almost twice the size? CUNY repeatedly publicizes its commitment to equity. And I would ask the city council, does this sound like equity to you? That the least prepared students are in the largest classes? That CUNY is an institution where inequity is allowed to flourish is obvious to anyone who works for CUNY. The time has come for our elected officials to demand answers from the decision makers as to why they have allowed this to happen. Kingsborough students uh, are not less uh, than, and it is time to stop treating them as though they are. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have questions for this panel. Chair Barron. Thank you. I want to particularly thank uh, the panel that are the ones that are in the trenches doing the work and understanding and being able to share with us the impact of what is happening when we talk about laying off of um, of the adjuncts. And I'm so glad that uh, Mr. Callie raised the question uh, or answered the question that I asked, which was, well, what's been the impact on courses being dropped because the instructors are not there? And it's been made very apparent through your comments. Well, there may not be courses being dropped because the classes are being expanded even more than double. So I'm glad you put it that way. It made it very clear to me and it will impact, it will further uh, uh, make it important for me to get that data from CUNY. Well, what do you mean you, you haven't dropped uh, 20 classes because uh, you've dropped the instructors that would have taught those 20 classes. So I'm glad for that to have been, um, to have been shared. And, and to our second panelist, Ms. Squillacote, hope I pronounced that right. You're, you said something in your testimony that has always been a rallying cry of mine, free and fully funded CUNY. I went to CUNY, many of you know, I say it often because it was free. That was back in the 60s and it was an entitlement for high school students in the city if they maintained a certain average that they were entitled to go to CUNY. And that's certainly what we are going to work to address. CUNY should not be operating on tuition paid by students who can barely afford their own housing and, 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 and food needs. And we see that often. So that's another part. And certainly we want to, again, talk about and address that issue of how, how actual and factual is it 
that there exists any kind of shared governance. And that was again, one of my opening questions that so presidents at each of the colleges had they have their own criteria for how they're going to function and what happens when presidents act in direct contradiction to a directive from the chancellor. So I wanna thank you for your, your input and uh, thank you for your testimony and encourage you to continue to do the great work that you do. Uh, it's so important and it's so relevant. And we're going to continue to fight for permanency and for better working conditions on behalf of all of you. And I will chair, I will turn it now to my co-chair, Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller, are you there? Are you on mute? I am now unmuted. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Chair Barron, and, and thank you to all the panelists for their testimony. Uh, clearly, uh, as you said, these, these are the people in the trenches and doing the work and, and their interpretation of the work and how those services get delivered are distinctly different from the testimony that we heard from the administration there. Or the, and, and so I, I kind of want to just take a, 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 a small dive into that and, and, and Barbara uh, talk about impact bargaining for sure. Right, because there's a lot of moving parts that are happening now, I, and I am. It's disturbing to me when when I hear agencies or administrators say that that the union was told the union is a partner, um, and and you don't tell your partner. You, you sit down and 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 you negotiate and you talk about it, and so um, if you can kind of give us a very a uh, brief synopsis of what those impact bargainings look like. Have they occurred? Uh, what is happening? They, they did uh, so-called commit to future conversations around impact bargaining, but what have they amounted to as of yet, uh, considering that we're having these conversations about larger class sizes and, and don't know if that came with uh, any additional compensation and some of the other things that certainly have, have, have occurred, some of, uh, um, and then certainly the uh, uh, implementation of uh, the 2017 agreement, whether it is it is uh, uh, further uh, compensations, uh, wage compensations, or other provisions uh, uh, afforded in the agreement, um, where are we with that? Um, is it ongoing? And 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 if you could speak specifically to some of the things that. Um, are ongoing or, or that you have not been able to reach an agreement with and and as well as uh, class sizes and, and certainly the impact of the increased sizes and on the delivery of instructions to uh, our scholars. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your um, attentiveness as the labor chair and a union person yourself to impact bargaining, uh, which is often not fully understood. Uh, we went to CUNY with a list of demands for impact bargaining in uh, April or May. Um, and the first of those was no layoffs um, and was no, and, and we call them layoffs for a reason um, that mm -hmm. I think I explained. Uh, but technically they're non reappointments, but when somebody has worked there for 20 years, um, and even if they're just teaching one course each semester for 20 years and you tell them don't come back, that's a layoff. Mm -hmm. uh, and CUNY can't have it both ways and say that these are uh, temporary and contingent disposable workers when they want to treat them that way and they're the backbone of instruction when they want them to be the backbone. Um, so that was our first demand. Um, as you can see, that was not met and not even really entertained. Um, we are still fighting over a second demand which was on reopening. Um, CUNY has um, kept most classes off campus, about 98% are off, uh, off campus. But we had to struggle and fight to um, make sure that, especially that um, our members whom, who, whom we represent, but they're not classroom teachers, that they, like librarians, that they were able to, teach, to do their work safely off campus also to make that transition. Um, and we are very concerned about reopening issues. 
at uh, the one K through 12 school we represent. We actually represent a K through 12 school at Hunter College. They have a Hunter College schools there. Um, and we were hours away from a strike with them. We had ordered the porta potties for the picket lines. I'll tell you that's how close we were um, because they were refusing to allow an independent inspector, a neutral outside independent inspector to do an inspection to see if the ventilation in that very problematic closed building was safe. Um, and we had to bring it to a strike and the inspector sitting outside for hours before they finally let him in. So we had demands on safety on reopening um, that still haven't been met. And then I'll just raise the others that you spoke about, class size. I'm really glad you mentioned that and, and highlighted that because um, as Scott Kelly said, uh, in many cases, CUNY's response to laying off adjuncts, reducing the teaching workforce has been to say, okay, we still have to teach those courses. We'll just cram more students into them. And that means that we necessarily can do less for students. I mean, if you have 45 or at Medgar Evers, it went from 26 uh, as a cap for students. At first, the college administration at Medgar said it's gonna go to 50. The union pushed back. They got it down to 42 and I believe now it's at 40, but 40 is unconscionable. The students, as Scott said, the most vulnerable students are the ones who are gonna get least attention. So that was one quote solution that CUNY took, just you know, pack them into the classes. Who cares about the quality of the education? Who cares about retention? Let's just pack them in there. And their other strategy was to cut courses. So at Brooklyn College and other places, um, they actually did cut sections of classes. I think Blanca spoke about this at Hunter, um, course sections being, being cut. So that means that students um, already, I believe 42% of our students at CUNY in a management survey said that they have trouble getting a course, this is before COVID, getting a course they need in order to graduate. Now think of what that percentage is. Um, they, you know, CUNY puts obstacles in the way of students who have already overcome huge obstacles just to be in your class. I mean, huge obstacles. They're heroic just to get there. And then to find, oh, you can't get that course because now we no longer offer it or we no longer offer it in the evenings or it's only Sunday mornings or something like that. So um, that was their other strategy. But on class size, uh, Chair Miller, and this is really critical, CUNY has steadfastly refused to bargain over class size. Um, under the Taylor Law, the, there's a, the impact of a change in class size, and this is where we get to impact bargaining. The impact of changes in class size is a mandatory subject of bargaining. And CUNY has sat at the bargaining table, bargaining Zoom with us, and refused to bargain over that. We are taking other action to try to compel them under the law, but we should not have to take CUNY to court to get them to follow the law on bargaining, um, on the impact of changes in class size. Um, people need not only more compensation if they're teaching double the students, but they need less workload because no matter how much you pay somebody, they can't manufacture time. They can't turn themselves into somebody who can give an hour a week to 42 students. If they're teaching three classes, their, their whole week is gone. Um, so that's what we really need is support. Um, and we need smaller classes. I mean, I'll just say this to end that, um, you know, I've taught at small, private, expensive colleges. And I know what parents want when they send their children to those colleges. The same professors that we have, the same qualifications, it's not that. What they want are small classes and individual attention. And if you have seven students in your class at Wellesley, and you have 42 at Medgar Evers, you can be sure which students already with more support and farther perhaps with more resources when they come in, which students are gonna do better. So not bargaining on class size is setting up our students to fail. Forget the rhetoric, it's uh, a plan for our students to fail, not just neglect, I would say it's a plan for our students to fail. So um, anything you can do, especially as chair of labor, uh, to say to CUNY, don't force this union to take you to court to bargain on a mandatory subject. Okay, yeah. So obviously, you know, what you're, you're saying that there has been no good faith bargaining 
as, as indicated by the Taylor Law around mandatory subjects of bargaining. Uh, uh, okay, so, so that is certainly something that, that we're going to, as, as a committee, take into consideration and uh, something that uh, I think that both committees can agree upon uh, being supportive. Uh, clearly, um, you know, we're doing something different with remote and distant learning. Um, I, I don't know if, if I, I know it was mentioned, someone uh, mentioned earlier uh, on the panel about what is national uh, accepted standards and, 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 and whether or not those standards are being adhered to, apparently not. Um, and, and so that kind of gives us leverage to address that, but we've seen that even um, at other, at, 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 in other areas of, of our young folks educational experience, be it the DOE or otherwise, uh, that um, we, we are lacking tremendously in the skills to be able to transition and provide these services, right? And so um, I know that your team is, is more than willing uh, to avail themselves of that. And, and, you know, most things are subject to, to bargaining. That being said, when it comes down to um, professional development around the areas of remote learning, uh, how much additional training, you know, they indicated that for which it was compensated, was that negotiated, was it real compensation? Um, and what other areas uh, uh, aside from the, the class side, so we know that there's tremendous impact on, you know, uh, increasing class sizes um, and, and attempting to do more with less in, in, in that area. But um, is there any other areas uh, that, that you want to highlight in terms mm -hmm. of upcoming uh, uh, impact bargaining? Thank you very much. And I will say, I mean, they have bargained on various things. Um, as Vice Chancellor Silverblatt said, we have made agreements on um, uh, provisions that had to be adjusted because people were teaching remotely, uh, certain things that talk about uh, observing a class in person and things like that, um, that you can't do when you're remote, you have to adjust those provisions. So um, there has been some bargaining, but not nearly, not nearly enough, not with enough urgency on their part. Um, so on the, um, on the issue of supporting people who have had to make the transition to remote work, and maybe some of my colleagues uh, want to speak about that too, um, Pam Silverblatt said, you know, they've been compensated. Well, let me tell you about that. First of all, not everybody has even been paid for it. I know of adjuncts who did that training and haven't been paid still, and they did it in July. Um, and maybe Blanca knows if some have been caught up, but I can think of one right now who was not paid from July from Kingsboro. Um, and second, the compensation, I believe, was $500 for doing a course that was, and maybe Scott or Robert can help here, I believe 10 hours of instruction and another at least 10 of uh, work that you had to do outside of class, more than that, and 15 outside of class says got more. Um, significantly more. Significantly yeah. more. I yeah. didn't take it. I should. Yeah. Uh, so, and the we uh, called for much higher compensation level, and that's in our demands. And we also called for equity compensation for adjuncts who did that work, and yeah. for additional compensation for adjuncts who uh, you know are paid by the technically by the hour, but really by the course. So during the summer, um, most of the full time faculty spent tons of time re-educating themselves about a whole new way of teaching. Adjuncts did that too, but adjuncts weren't on salary. Um, so we uh, had not had a successful outcome. We did, they did not bargain on that compensation. And I see um, Professor Farrell probably wants to add to that. So I hope he can be unmuted if that's possible. Uh, yeah, thank you, Barbara. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there were also different tiers or qualities of online instruction training that some faculty, particularly part-time faculty, were excluded from uh, the higher tiers of training, uh, both that had uh, better quality of instruction, more compensation, et cetera. Uh, and I also wanna mention that the professional staff, while transitioning to fully online work, received no support, no training 
uh, often have to use their own equipment in their um, remote work. And uh, the transition to remote work for those uh, some faculty, but mostly uh, professional staff, has, has been shamefully uh, neglected by CUNY. All right. And Chair Miller, um, we don't have Frankie Laude with us, the um, one who wrote the op-ed um, that you mentioned, Chair Barron. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, planning to come. He's got a very uh, heavy schedule and um, I'll make sure you get his op-ed. He's fantastic. And we also have, he's spoken in public before. Maybe I can get you the tape of that. Um, because it's great that we have two adjuncts here, at least so far, there may be others who are gonna speak, um, Rosa Sklocote and Blanca Vasquez. Um, Frankie has a lot to say also, so um, I, I'm looking forward to having them have more chance to speak. Okay, thank you. So, and, and then finally, um, in the area of, of health benefits, was there any negotiations around that for, for any extended, were there an extended period of time where people actually were laid off for which uh, CUNY, whomever picked up the uh, premiums? No, zero. And that was one of our demands that CUNY continue health insurance for any person who was laid off or discontinued uh, yeah. through at least the end of the pandemic, the, the end of this coming academic, yeah. this academic year. Yeah. And yeah. they did. Sorry. I said no. I, I just I was saying yes. Yeah, certainly, that's not a precedent. No, uh, it's not. In, that in was at, at all. That's usually the first thing you ask for, particularly right. in a time that we're in a, a national health crisis and pandemic. That is, is it becomes that much more important. There, I think that that would be a priority if you know, um, and keeping everyone safe. Yes. And, and right, because it, yeah. it's, um, it's not just you yourself, but if you get sick, that puts burdens on other people um, to care for you and exposes other workers. And in public health, in a public health crisis, it's insane not to continue that. Um, I will say that because of negotiations that we did, um, and I think Pam Silverblatt mentioned this, an adjunct who taught through the spring, only just the spring, um, their health insurance extended through July. And if you taught in the fall and the spring, your insurance extended through August, but that's not enough. Um, and we pushed for much longer. And I've also been trying to work, and this is where I'd love to um, see if, if the council could be advocates in addition. Um, I've worked directly with Renee Campion, the labor commissioner for the mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. um, really, really seeing if the city can do something. It is not a huge expense for a few months. Exactly and, the point, right. exactly the point, yeah. Exactly, yeah. and that I should think, be a priority. Yeah. yeah, I think Blanca wanted to say something. Blanca Vasquez, were you? Okay, that there's a real overlap between the three-year appointments and healthcare because people who get the three-year appointment have seniority, right? So that when you lay off three-year people, you're actually laying off people on healthcare. So, I mean, right. think about the impact of that at John Jay, for example. You know, so it's a real hardship. It's a real hardship. Okay. Chair Barron. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that we've also been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. We welcome him as well. Uh, to Ms. Rivera, are there any council members who would like to raise questions? If any council members have questions for this panel, please use the raise hand function in Zoom so we can call on you. Seeing no raised hands, uh, we can continue. Chair Barron, should we go to the next panel? I just wanna thank this panel once again because they're the persons who are in the front, on the in the ranks, in the trenches, and understand all of the uh, complexities of what it is that we're looking at. And we want to thank you and say that we're going to continue to work on behalf of, of your membership to make sure that we get equity and justice and accountability and transparency for your members because it's certainly what they're entitled to. Thank you so much. Thank you. I echo, I echo those sentiments. Thank you. Uh, this panel has now been concluded.
I will now call witnesses in order for this for the next panel of public testimony. We will have Ian Ross Singleton, Professor of Writing, and Sarah Ortiz, Vice Chair of Graduate Affairs for the University Student Senate. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony. Remember that, are, that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on Professor Singleton. Time starts now. Uh, it looks like we may have lost Professor Singleton. So we will call on Ms. Ortiz, Vice Chair of Graduate Affairs for the University Student Senate. Time starts now. Thank you all for this important conversation. Thank you, esteemed members of the committee and um, vice chairs. I, I'm so inspired by all of you and thank you so much for your advocacy on behalf of the students. Um, I, I just wanna say um, a few comments. A former pub, uh, American public school teacher and adjunct instruct, instructor once said, being a teacher is not what I do, it is who I am. This dedicated former adjunct who taught English at Northern Virginia Community College earned $82,022 according to her tax returns in 2011. This former adjunct is Dr. Jill Biden, uh, wife of President-elect Joe Biden. Regardless of what this tempestuous hurricane of election season and year we find ourselves grasping for, in light of the enduring reality of a global pandemic, economic crises and tectonic shifts and ra racial disparities, it, it has become clear that there will be a push for a recalibration of resources for increased funding and support for both teachers, uh, especially adjunct instructors and students in higher education here in the United States. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sarah Susan Ortiz and I'm testifying as Vice Chair for Graduate Affairs on behalf of the CUNY University Student Senate. Uh, we are in full support of the adjuncts and I thank you all again uh, for having this very important conversation today. Um, I'm a Lat Latinx graduate student in my second year of the International Migration Studies MA program at the Graduate Center CUNY, where I serve as uh, also a student representative on our program's executive committee. Um, I'm going to stop there and just go off script and just say um, my dear friend is an adjunct uh, instructor at Hunter, and this year she had to deal with um, not only the precarity of her employment, um, but also her only daughter was actually diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Uh, so she has, we have our own thread um, for, our, for our group and um, she's just been, we've been back and forth about whether or not she, she is going to have employment. Now, she, actually today I said, can I speak to your, you know, to what you're going through? And she said, yes, I'm teaching, but I will only, have one class at CUNY. I'm also teaching at two SUNY schools, so three part-time jobs. Many adjuncts have a similar story. Um, so I, I just want you to sort of understand the precarity that um, my my friends adjunct professors are facing, who are also CUNY students. So, uh, in addition to these increased class sizes, like you know what everyone has mentioned. Um, many of the students are also adjunct professors. And so um, on behalf of the Graduate Council, on behalf of uh, the Doctoral and Graduate Students Council, I just want to, and University Student Senate, I want to say we're in full support of um, adjunct faculty. And we just want to make sure that um, the increased funding for the CARES Act uh, is allocated equitably um, in, you know, like in a, an in a, in a way that um, really honors the labor that people put in. Um, a lot of the folks who are actually putting in extra hours are adjunct faculty um, as far as like, you know, um, a lot of our international students have actually been excluded because of draconian federal, federal policies. Um, so um, a lot of our adjunct faculty, faculty have stepped up and saying, I'll teach in Central Park. Um, so there's no reason why faculty should be donating their time, they should be equitably compensated, and um, there should be also um, support um, in terms of not only equitable pay, but, but health care and um, contracts for our fa faculty. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I 
I appreciate the conversation of today. Thank you for our testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who wanted to testify at this hearing, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call on you. In the meantime, we also ask council members with questions for this panel to please use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now turn to Chair Barron for her questions. Uh, thank you so much. I, I do want to thank the representative on behalf of the graduate program, graduate affairs, because we understand that this is a problem that is not limited to just our community colleges and senior colleges and the undergraduate program, the undergraduate course offering. And we thank you for your testimony. And we do extend our prayers and best wishes on behalf of your friend's child that there would be a positive or great outcome at the end of what we're going through. We want to extend that to you as well. Thank you. Chair Miller, do you have any questions for this panel? Most importantly, I'd like to thank them for participating. We need to hear uh, from, from everyone and so that we are addressing this holistically and, and we know who our target audience is. We know who our student body is um, throughout and we know who are providing instructions to this student body. And, and so in underserved marginalized communities, we wanna make sure that we're lifting up those voices and that those voices are heard. So it's important that everyone comes out and not assume that someone else is telling your story at this hearing here today. Your story is unique and it needs to be told. So I want to thank all for coming out and, and sharing their voices this, this morning, now afternoon. Thank you. Seeing no hands raised by either members of the public or council members, this concludes our testimony for today's hearing. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and presence. Uh, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs Barron and Miller, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Chair Barron, if you have any closing remarks. Uh, just to say, I'm so pleased with everyone who took the time to come and to share their experiences, firsthand knowledge of what the problems are that we face. And we know that every problem has a solution. And we're going to make sure that as we move forward, that we keep a, a pressure, uh, a constant pressure on what's happening. So to not get pushed to the side, uh, someone had suggested we give a, a week's uh, framework for them to respond to questions that we've asked. Uh, I also, I'm disappointed that CUNY did not stay in the hearing, I don't see them noted here. Perhaps they are just going to observe it. Well, we will send questions as we always do, and we will get a response and we will share that with you as well. Uh, Council Member Chair Miller. Thank you, uh, Chair Barron. I would say that I look forward to collaborating with you and your committee and really putting together a letter, not just questions, but of demands of, of CUNY. Um, based on what we've learned here this afternoon. Uh, and I think that we've learned a lot. We had some very specific questions that we wanted to drill down on. But there's also a lot that we didn't learn uh, that is necessary about how we continue to move forward and in, in, in advancing you know, the, the, the educated, educational experience of, of uh, CUNY students, but more importantly, those who provide those services because we always say here that all labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and shall be undertaken with painstaking excellence. And that's what they do each and every day. And as was highlighted, sometimes we do it with two and three different jobs, right? And, and that is a story that once again needs to be told. I thank everyone for coming out and sharing their experiences and telling their story. I thank uh, the members of the committees for coming and staying with us um, this afternoon. I know it's been uh, relatively long, but absolutely necessary. 
And I look forward to uh, really hearing from CUNY in, in the very near future. So thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, once again, uh, Chair Barron, thank you for allowing me to be a part, asking this committee to be a part. It is it, it's really essential that we do this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're uh, so glad that you were able to add your expertise in this field to this hearing. And with mm -hmm. that, it being no further business to be conducted, I will have my shake array to gavel out and end this and adjourn this hearing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>